These are the voices of Latin American cello. Estas son las voces del cello latinoamericano. I am Horacio Contreras, and I welcome you to the Voices of Latin American Cello. I am on the faculty of Lawrence University, the Music Institute of Chicago, and Center Stage Strings at the University of Michigan, and I am the co-author of the Sphinx Catalog of Latin American Cello Works. Today, I will be speaking with two great artists that are collaborating right now in a very interesting project. Horacio Fernandez Vasquez is a Mexican composer that is based in New York. Right now he's pursuing studies, studies in, at Juilliard, at the Juilliard School. And Slatomir Fong is one of the most accomplished cellists of his generation. He uh, won a couple years ago the first prize of the Tchaikovsky competition and that's only the tip of the iceberg and I am so pleased to welcome you both uh, to this program that it, its aim is to convey directly the idea what is going on with the Latin American music for cello right now. Welcome Thank you back. so much for that nice introduction. You both are really young, and I think that a lot of our audience is, is, is made of young cellists and, and, and composers and people that are about your age. So I, I, would, I would be very interested for them to know how they, they are similar to you in some way. So why, why don't you start um, speaking about your background, Horacio? Of course, of course. Well, um as very kindly said by my tocayo, Horacio Contreras. And for those of you who don't know, tocayo is, is, a, is the name that we call uh, people who have this, uh, our same name back in Mexico. Um, I am from Mexico, I'm a Mexican composer. I am 24 years old and I'm currently studying at Jujuru School of Music. And my, my path in music is, is, a very, is a very particular one because I began completely immersed in popular music and just liking it and everything. Uh, my parents were not musicians at all but I always had a fascination for like pretty melodies and nice rhythms and all that. So just life kind of took me in many directions, especially because of my love for the Beatles, who were my biggest, my first big inspiration. And uh, I mean, one of the, one of their members, Paul McCartney was my, my first musical idol and I always wanted to be a little bit like him. That's why, which is why I, I, I ended up deciding to be a composer. So those were passions in my life that eventually led me to composing. And then when I was uh, about six, uh, 16 or 18 or something like that, I, I discovered Latin dancing. So I, I started to take ballroom uh, classes and, and doing small competitions for like salsa dancing, bachata dancing, reggaeton dancing, which is what eventually led me to write Latin American music because through dancing, I fell in love with it because I always wanted to dance more in parties to get more girls, of course, which is what the inspiration behind my, my starting to take the classes. So. That is how I arrived at being a composer, and then that's how I arrived at being a, uh, influenced by Latin music. And how did you get connected with the instrument? How did you get connected with the cello? Oh, I, I'm really glad that you that you asked, um, because I, as I said, I don't come from a musical family. My parents were not musicians, but all of my cousins uh, from my father's side just happened to fall into the cello, uh, kind of by accident in our in our uh, generation. Because in Mexico, um, uh, while, while we were very young, um, a, an orchestra for children began 
well, was uh, was uh, was founded. That's called Esperanza Azteca, which is was actually modeled after El Sistema from Venezuela, which is very interesting because I'm now speaking to to you, who you're a Venezuelan cellist. So in Mexico, we try, we were trying to do the same thing, and a lot of my uh, my, my cousins uh, fell into into this new uh, into into this new um, cycle of orchestras. So all the instruments that they all played was a cello. So I kind of grew up surrounded by young cellists who were trying to, you know, do their first steps in music because none of us really came from a musical background. So we all, you know, um, grew, grew up together, like doing this. We were very close. So Slatomir, like, can you please share a little bit with us about your background and your love for chess and all sorts of things and, and then your life with cello? Sure, sure. So I, uh, I, was, um, I was born in this country. I, I was born in Ithaca, New York, but uh, my mother was uh, from Bulgaria and she studied to be a mathematician and she moved with her family to the United States uh, in uh, the early 1990s. And uh, that's where she met my father, who is uh, Chinese American, and he was also studying mathematics. He was born in the U.S., but his parents came from Hong Kong and Vietnam and they were ethnically Chinese. Um, so um, I feel very feel very lucky to be from such a diverse ethnic background. And um, I began to play the cello when I was three years old, uh, just because my on my mother's side, uh, there was always a lot of love, love for classical music. And, um, and uh, my mother wanted me to play an instrument sort of as part of my education. So I started playing the cello when I was three. And um, you know, I played for throughout my childhood. It wasn't really until I was around 12 or 13 um, actually around the time that I met Richard Aaron, um, uh, that I, I became really serious about it and I wanted to, 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 to do it um, you know, more and, uh, at, a, at a higher level and perhaps pursue it professionally. So um, yeah, since then I've just been, uh, you know, I, I felt kind of fell in love with music, I guess, at, at that time. And I saw that it was really what I wanted to do, how I wanted to, to express myself. I, I also studied with Richard. I know that he's, one, one of the things that I really liked about studying with him is that he had this vein for modern music and he always organized things so that his students would uh, collaborate with living composers and that I found that really interesting because in, in my previous experiences with teachers I didn't find that there was so much of an emphasis on modern music even though I did modern music, but it was not like a, a thing, you know? So uh, did, did you have the same experience with Richard? Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's such an enthusiast for, and, and, a, and a, an ambassador also for like modern cello music. I remember my, um, I think it was my first summer at, at the Aspen Music Festival. He, um, mm -hmm. he did this very fun project where he had all the, all the student composers at Aspen write uh, a work for cello ensemble for 12 cellos and it was like themes on the uh, variations on the theme uh, of NPR's All Things Considered. Like, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. So we like did like, and we, we actually recorded them professionally and it was, uh, it was really cool. So, I mean, he was just really into collaborating with, with the composers and um, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's great. He, he always said something funny to me. He was like, you know, you have to think of composers as like, as like stocks, you know, would you rather buy the stock when it's like really cheap and undervalued and then see it? Wow. Yes, you know, so it was like, so you got to always look for the, the young composers who are not known because it's like investing in, in Amazon when it's five bucks a share, you know? I'm very, I'm very, very cheap at the moment. <laughs> Extremely cheap. So how, how did you guys meet? I knew of Slammer uh, from fairly early on and I knew that he was a great cellist. And then, of course, I got to know him because I, uh, I knew that he was going to go to uh, participate in the, in the Tchaikovsky competition. So, I, you know, we, had a, a, we have a, a couple of classmates who went as well. So I was kind of following the competition and everyone's path in there. And I was, from the beginning, I was very surprised to see the type of, uh, of repertoire that he was choosing. While most of the, most of the cellos were, were playing fairly standard repertoire, uh, I was seeing Salomon so playing Carter and Berio and uh, another composer that I think was Romanian or something that's, that's, that's very special. And uh, from, from the beginning, I, I was very interested in, in seeing that he, ch he chose to play these very 
uh, unusual pieces for like competitions. That's something that I was very interested about. And, and I, I was a little bit more interested when, when he won the thing. So, ha. and uh, and he actually won, please correct me if I'm wrong, Zammer, that you won with uh, Shostakovich's second cello concerto, right? That's right, that's right. Yes, and, and that, you know, for anyone who's not a cellist, um, that's, that, that, that's somewhat surprising because it's not, that, it's, it's not a popular piece to play, especially for competitions, I think. So ever since I saw it, I, was, I, I said, you know, if, if I wanted to work with a composer, uh, with a cellist at Juilliard, I would really like to approach him because he's, of course, a wonderful, wonderfully skilled player, but he also has this interest for uh, contemporary music. So I kind of got to know him in that way, and I was artistically interested in working with him from then. Slatomir, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about how did you uh, start collaborating with Horacio, and how did you start this this friendship? Uh, Horacio is such a, a uh, a friendly and, you know, outgoing person. Uh, so like whenever I saw him in the hallway, you know, he'd be like, Oh, Hey man, how's it going? What's up? And he'd always like ask, you know, interesting questions like, Oh, you know, how, how's this class going or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we got to know each other, like, you know, over time, just kind of on a, on a, on a you know, regular basis, we just see each other at school. And uh, then I, I remember at, at some point he, he sent me an email and he was like, you know, Hey, I, ha I have this piece and that, that I wrote, um, uh, for Philip Shigog, who who's a, a colleague of ours and, and, a, and a wonderful cellist and also a, a great uh, ambassador for uh, absolutely our music, um, and uh, and he sent me the recording. I I, I watched it. Um, Philip's performance of, of um, the uh, a Prelude and, and Bossa Nova, uh, number two, and um, and I was like, wow, this is you know it's pretty pretty cool. It's pretty slick, you know, all this uh, amazing uh, extended techniques and pizzicato. So. Um, you know, then we were, we were chatting and talking about, um, maybe, maybe finding a way for me to, to play it. And then, you know, eventually I, I, uh, we, we did a, a nice recording of it and, uh, it was, it was really, it's great to work with Horacio because he's, um, he's a very open-minded composer and, you know, that's, that's really nice as a performer. Like when you have someone who's not set in the ways of how they want it, when they're willing to, you know, adapt and, and understand that music is always something that's evolving and, and flexible and, you know, things can be changed, um. So it's, yes. he's, he's a great collaborator. Yes, and if I may say something, uh, one of my, my tricks as a composer has always, has always been to try to find really good performers or really special performers and not get in their way, not ruin them by trying to impose the notes that I've already written. If something is, is not working, uh, I, don't want, I, I don't want you to play anything that makes you uncomfortable anyway. And if you want to add something here and take something out there, I'm totally down for that. There's really very few things that I'm very particular about that I think that music needs. So Slatomi, do you want to just show a little bit of how it, how it goes? Sure, yeah. This is, um, well, this moment, uh, the, the beginning of the Bossa Nova, I really, I really like. Um, also, I'll tell one other story. Um, I just, you know, sort of what, what, you were, what you were saying is like how when we worked on it, um, Things, certain things changed. I remember there was a very nice moment where it was like somewhere deep and it was, it was very contrapuntal. And we were mm -hmm. talking about how like you were very influenced by Bach in this piece yes. in, addition, in addition to the, you know, the, the real kind of authentic rhythms. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. kind of that, that mix that makes the piece so special. And, um, and there was this one particular like bass note and like we were <laughs> kind of fooling, fooling around and like I played yeah. this one and we were both like, oh yes, that's it. That's yes. What Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what that's what I do. So when sometimes when I would sometimes when I work with a performer, he does something like do that, do that again. I have and since I don't have no perfect pitch, I have no idea what they did. But like just do it again. And you know, he we would just look for the note that he played. <laughs> this is just the beginning of the bossa nova. Uh, It's great, yeah, great piece. I always tell people when you have a great cellist, a great artist, you don't need a lot of notes. You Absolutely. only need like four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are different. You need, you need like five notes and then you, you already know what is like, that you will remember forever what is going to happen.
So, um, you know, after you guys collaborated in this piece, um, how did you start thinking about perhaps being a little bit more ambitious and composing a concerto? How was, how was that? After, after working with Zahmer, uh, I had such a pleasant experience with him being able to basically do anything and uh, he just hit just being open. And I think we have a certain chemistry while we're working, working together that, that I really enjoy. So I just I just knew that I wanted to work with him again, and uh, and I thought okay so I have this this person who's a fantastic player and uh, that I have a chemistry with I think I could really propose something a little bit more big, and that's when I had the idea of writing a, a cello concerto, and uh, it, it basically all started because I began and started to become very fascinated and interested in cumbia music, which is very important type of uh, genre in, over in Mexico and all of Latin America. And I remember seeing the, the accordion because it's also, it's, that's one of the main instruments in the, in the type of cumbia that we listen to in Mexico. And I was, I was listening to a lot of songs that use the accordion. And there was, uh, there was a particular moment where there, there was a very romantic, very nice introduction to a cumbia song with just accordion. And I, I listened to it and then the beat dropped. And I remember thinking at that point, oh my God, I think I think that's that, I think that's what my cello concerto is going to be about. It's going to be about um, a cumbia, and I'm going to use a cello. I want to use uh, an instrument to replace the accordion. I wonder what it could be. And when I heard this introduction to to this song with la, like nice lush chords of the accordion, I said, I think that the cello can do that. And that actually became the introduction of of my cumbia concerto, and it's the first thing I wrote. And that's how everything everything started. Just because of that introduction I heard, and I wrote my own, I said, I think everything can, can start from there. You know, sometimes composers have a, a, a certain sound in their mind when they compose. I mean, they don't compose for a generic cello. They compose for mm -hmm. this particular, like, like Brahms, for example, that composed yes. for, for Hausmann, you know? And, uh, yes. So did you have... Any, did you have already Slatomir sound in your head when you started composing or you? Yes, you're... actually, 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 yes, because, uh, because uh, one of the things that I think Slatomir is, is known for is for his huge artistry as, uh, as a performer and being very deep. And once I, I figured out that the piece had to start with this, uh, with these like lush chords and big sound, I thought, yes, Slatomir can absolutely pull that out. But I also wanted to challenge him because um, I wanted for us to look for a way to reinvent cello technique can do something different. And I think uh, Salomon can tell you about this, but there exists something in violin playing and also cello playing that's called chopping technique, where instead of, uh, instead of playing uh, with a bow, you know, left and right as, as, as we're always been taught, and you kind of like let it fall. And that's a technique that's very, very used in uh, bluegrass music and other types of music, and it had never been used really in Latin music. And I just kind of wanted to explore that. So, and actually I think the, the hardest part of my concerto is just these four bars that we had to work on a lot and we actually worked with Philip Shio on how to get it perfected because Latimer had to learn the technique and then, and the technique that I use is like new, I, I, I created it and it's even harder. So why, why don't you show us a little bit how that, how that worked, Salamer? I should, I should just say that 
I'm, I'm still learning it, and uh, course, it's, it's by no means perfect, but uh, um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that um, is so interesting about the chopping is um, is that, you know, normally, and this is kind of the way that, that our friend Philip Shegog described it, is that, you know, normally when you when you play, it's, it's uh, always a horizontal motion, like uh, relative, the bow relative to the string, but the chopping is like, you're just going down, you know, and there's no, there's no sense of moving left and right, it's just up and down, so you this kind of sound and it can get really like rhythmic uh... and later um... yeah, so it's kind of cool rhythms that you can pull yeah I did that to imitate a very particular instrument in cumbia music that's called the uh, the guira, and it's like this metallic guiro kind of instrument, and it just it sounds like, and I was very fascinated when I realized that a cello could do it as well, um, because the cello you know would be doing the bass, would be doing like the melody, and also do the the percussion, which I found very interesting. And if you see the trailer that I already posted, um, once the rhythm starts, the cello is the one that begins the rhythmic section and then you know the conga star and all that which i think was something very you know innovative i, I really hadn't seen that like the cello being used in that way in a crescendo especially yeah cello can do anything you want uh, you only yes. have to find a, a guy that is talented enough and crazy enough one of the one of the authorities in this country about alternative styles is also a student of richard right My, mike block He's one of the authorities of, of alternative styles and all of this chopping and things is incredible. He's plays standing and sings and it's like unbelievable. <laughs> actually this is one of the, one of his books and kind of like a bible to me contemporary cello etudes and it's actually a, a, a book i gifted slammer that that includes a lot of like uh extended techniques but like from the popular music world that are usable like you know in, in pop music and, and all that and one and there are many chapters on chopping and uh yeah my block is actually a great a great influence on on my, on my writing as well so you played some of the etudes on the book, Slatomir. Did you play some of those etudes? I I was looking at some of these choppy etudes, but I had to I had to simplify them because they're still too hard for me. You know, they get quite complicated with the rhythm. Yeah, I know, I know. They are hard. I have tried them too, and it's it's not easy, but it by no means it's easy. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's one of the 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 things that a performer has to have is like you have to find the resources that match the challenges and you have to be creative like people think that practicing is just follows these strategies and this and but you have the practicing is a very creative activity technique is absolutely a very absolutely also you know like I, I i invite you guys to see a, a Venezuelan composer whose name is, and he also plays cello, his name is Gonzalo Grau. Okay. Go on Instagram and see Gonzalo how he Grau. plays salsa, everything on his cello. He has this, uh, like, uh, challenge. It's mm -hmm. called the Soneo Challenge. Okay. So he has this salsa background and then mm -hmm. people come in and just uh, jam on on top mm -hmm. of it wow. and then he posts the the result Donde está? 
Just a pop, preludio en bossa nova, uh, cumbia concerto. You know, we 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 are speaking about a collaboration of, of Horacio and, and my piano trio, the Reverón piano trio, perhaps mm -hmm. around rap. So Horacio, yes. you you seem to be very interested in in Latin American urban popular music. Yes, absolutely. So you know. When, when we're composers, we're constantly thinking about what is my role as an artist? Because I am supposed to create new art, new music. So what can I do to further the development of this art form? Uh, you know, and when you come from such a colorful place like myself from Latin America, there's a lot that you can take from. But it's something that I think that a lot of uh, classical composers who come from countries like myself have, have been missing in, in the past is that they try to write uh, in kind of like a European style which is fine and, 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 and it, was, uh, it made sense uh, some years ago, but there are many other sources of inspiration that we can take from. A lot of, a lot of people have turned to folk music, you know, um, and the, the type of music that's already kind of like accepted in their, in, their, in their countries. For example, it would be very easy for me to write mariachi music or for Argentinas to um, write tango music because it's already kind of like folk popular and it's been like accepted by the general population. There's, there's a room for it. But uh, I really like being a champion for, for things that are not uh, well accepted yet. And urban Latin music and in genres such as bachata or reggaeton or cumbia or merengue, these are all genres that are still very much outside of, the, uh, of academia. They're still very much seen as you know, vulgar music that should, not, should never be uh, paired with classical music. It's like, it's the antithesis of classical music. So that's why I was very interested in working with these particular styles. And cumbia, for example, uh, it's a very interesting example because it's, it's a type of music that, that comes from Colombia, but it, it, it uh, basically infested all Latin America through the drug trade, through Pablo Escobar. And uh, that music from Colombia came you know, to Mexico and to, and to Bolivia and, every, and everywhere else. And uh, there's... There's this huge subculture uh, of, of people in the north of Mexico that identify with, with cumbia and, and the dancing and the culture and, and all that. And they adopt traits from uh, gangster culture in the, in, the U, in the U.S. And they dress in a very particular way and they dance in, in, in a very particular way. And that is a fascinating part of culture. I think it's urban folk. It's modern folklore, which is uh, it's, it's amazing for me that we have. The Saraband is a very... Uh, uh... Interesting genre, and I, 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 you know, I always remember the reggaeton. You know, when I, I think that sarabanda and reggaeton are similar in a way because, of course, the sarabanda is origin originally from Latin America, mm -hmm. and uh, actually the first composer of the first ever recorded sarabanda, the 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 writer uh, was was put to trial because it was an, it's a dance that was inappropriate. The, the, the lyrics were inappropriate. The dancing was inappropriate for the time. And, you know, it's a little bit like reggaeton. You know, it's the, there's this culture of, of saying that re cancel reggaeton and all of these things. And that's, that's the time that we're living. And that's, a, that's just a cultural uh, expression of, of of this generation, as Sarabanda was in that generation, and then Bach didn't have any biases against against it. So I, I guess that um, my next question is very interesting to me because you know we as performers we are always told that you have to feed your ideas with 
the cultural background and you know with Bach we have all of these traditions with dances and dance mm -hmm. music yeah. performing dance music and and look into the dance steps and and thinking about the kind of culture if it's an italian corrente if it is a french current and so forth so slatomi i'm wondering if you would like how did you approach all of this urban popular music that is or how are you approaching in this process of working through the concerto the, the, all of this reggaeton and cumbia that is on on horacio's piece Right, right. Well, actually, so the I remember in one of our first meetings about the piece, um, mm -hmm. Horacio, he actually prepared this very nice PowerPoint for me. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I PowerPoint, pitched it. <laughs> PowerPoint presentation about yes. cumbia. And, um, uh, and I, I, I was very impressed by that because not only was it a very detailed presentation, but, you know, you could tell by the way that he spoke about it that he was very passionate about the, about the culture of, of cumbia. And, um, he showed me some videos of, of, of uh, well, he some videos with the music, of course, the traditional music, but then also the, the dancing. And, um, and he, he also recommended this film on Netflix, I, I Am No Longer Here, which is, um, which I was just watching some of today. And uh, there's some great dance scenes in there um, with, uh, you know, the main character and his, and his, and his, and his friends. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I, that was inspirational about that for me is that, um, you know, when, when, when you see them dancing, it's kind of like it's it's a it's a specific type of expression that is is, is quite quite far from from the typical like um, very polished way that, for example, you might approach if you were dancing a, a, a box a box or a bond or something where it's very virtuosic. Instead, it's more of just this kind of uh, uh, authentic, free flowing way of doing things and. And that's I find inspiration in that for the way that I play the music because I think that it's very liberating to have a composer like Horacio who writes music that has uh, this uh, this uh, requirement of authenticity to be above <laughs> anything else you know above the technique above above the execution and uh, and just it allows you to just be free as the performer to say like okay I'm really going for something here I'm going for the rhythm or I'm going for this this groove or the feeling um, yeah so. I feel that you you guys are really looking uh, to Latin American urban popular music with a very be with beautiful eyes, and mm -hmm. that's wonderful to see in, in in young talented people as as you both are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, you know, like we we have of course our, our audience uh, sent us some questions and I, I want to uh, share some of them with you if that's okay of course please so yes. i will uh, i will start with um uh with uh horacio um did, did, did they say for your next project do you plan to compose a piece that involves quieter rhythms like boleros yes Yes, of course, and, and thank you, thank you for that question, because uh, well, basically, I want I would like to, to start by saying that my favorite emotion is nostalgia. It's my absolute favorite like thing to write about and to think about. I'm a very melancholic guy, and if any of you are my friend and you talk to me a lot, I'm always going to be talking about the past with very uh, you know hopeful eyes, and I, I I always want that to feel strong emotions towards that, and. You know, nostal nostal nostalgic music can can absolutely be like bossa nova or like bolero or like rancheras and things like that. So absolutely, I I wor I've worked with those genres in the past, and I and, and and I look forward to writing a lot more in the future because you know we're not all about dancing. We we all we, we sometimes also sit down and have have a drink, have a tequila shower or something, and reminisce about past uh, past days. So yes, absolutely, I'm definitely going to do that. And then, here's a question for for Slatomir. Um, can you please speak about your your gear? They say your gear. So like I guess that they say they speak about the curtains or the chair or what what you have. <laughs> perhaps the cello. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. So um, the cello I'm currently playing on. Let me just uh, get it. Is uh, this is the um, 1731 uh, Braga. Stradivarius um, 
Cool. And it's uh, on loan to me uh, from rare, generously on loan to me um, from Rare Violins of New York uh, to shop in New York City. And um, uh, they have a, um, a, a consortium program there where they loan out fine instruments. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that, uh, the opportunity to play on such a, a work of you know history and, and a work of art. Um, and my bow is um, uh, made around 1800 by Jean-Pierre-Marie Persois, who was a, a great French maker uh, and um, kind of in the, in the tradition of tort. Uh, and um, the strings that I play on are uh, all versum, Tomastic Infeld versum medium strings. They're my favorite strings. Um, let's see, I have just an ordinary Chinese wolf eliminator. This is an Andrea <laughs> soloist rosin. Um, yeah. my chair is just, a. it's a little creaky <laughs> right now, but it's just a dining room chair. <laughs> I play with a Manhasset stand. Oh, is I it, is it a Stradivari my... chair? Oh, sorry? Is it a Stradivari chair? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crafted, yeah. I, I ignore a lot of things and, you know, I, I, I'm not embarrassed to say that I don't know. I, I don't know why is this uh, instrument uh, named Braga. Do you know why 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 is it named Braga? Yes, yeah, so because there was a a player. I think he was living in the late nineteenth century named Gaetano Braga, and he was an Italian cellist and composer and virtuoso. He's actually most famous not for being a cellist, but he wrote this one very popular tune, which has been like recorded and sung by many. It's called the, the Serenade, the Braga Serenade. And um, wow. yeah, and and um, so the the cello is named after him um, because um, uh, he was a great cellist who played it. Did Did you feel a little bit of pressure when you got that instrument in your hands? You know, uh, originally I I would say yes. There there is this pressure like, oh my God, you know, the 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 piece of wood that I'm holding is is you know worth so much money and stuff. But but after a while, you kind of you develop a relationship with it. And I feel like maybe you had this experience too, but you sort of see it for what it is. And I think ultimately the soul of what it is, is when it's being played, the beauty of the sound that it can create, the, the sensitivity that it has. And it, that's kind of, you recognize it as its best self, you know, so you just play it with all your heart. And uh, <laughs> yeah. you say it it's so beautifully, but yes, that, that is correct. That, that's what they are made for. For guys like you to make make them sound the best they can sound. Well, I'm just very proud that that he that I'm making him play cumbias on it. That's a kind of <laughs> personal victory of mine. And Mexicans would find it hilarious, by the way. Yeah, yeah, no, no. you had to you had to ca call it now the Braga slash cumbia. Yeah, the cumbia cello. Yeah. Another question is: Don't you think your piece falls in what? is so so called cultural appropriation yeah i think i think it's it's our responsibility as as authors as musicians to 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 kind of represent the world as it is especially me that i come from a cultural landscape that has music as a, in a very important part of it i i i i feel like i need as my I, I have to you know be honest about the the sound world that i come from and even though I don't exactly come from the same type of uh, places where this music originated in Mexico, I still live inside this music. Whenever I went to parties, that's the music that we heard. I danced this music uh, recreationally with friends and parties and all that. So I couldn't help but being inspired by it and being influenced by it. And whenever I do anything with, with it and all the projects that I'm doing around the concerto, um, like the, the film I'm making to accompany the, mu the, the music, um, I always do it with the utmost, utmost respect for the culture and in, with, the, with the intention of always, you know, saying where the, the music comes from and in adapting it and transforming it. So I don't see, my, I don't see myself as being stealing the culture. I think I see, I see that I see myself as being a part of what is making it, you know, evolve and change through time. That's exactly what you're doing. You, you grew in a soundscape is the same as I. I mean, every time I would get into a, a, like the public transportation, that's what I hear, cumbia or vallenato or, mm -hmm. or reggaeton. Yes. That's what I, I hear every day. So what I don't hear, I don't hear any Rachmaninoff <laughs> <laughs> in, in the public yeah. transportation. 
you know, another question, uh, I, another question is like, and I guess you can both answer to this, is uh, about the recording process, especially okay. do, during that, this COVID time where everything is so difficult to get together and all of the masking and the social distancing and these spaces cannot hold more than mm -hmm. one and a half people at the same time. And <laughs> one and a half. <laughs> one of the things that, um, that, that, you know, I, I, I admired about this whole project with the Cumbia Concerto was that you approached me like pretty early on in the quarantine. It must have been like April or something. Yes. And, and, you know, at that time, you know, I, along with, I think a lot of other people were kind of like, oh my God, you know, like what, what, what you know, what, what is the meaning of our life, you know, <laughs> but, but yeah. you had still the initiative to, mm -hmm. to be creative and think the few, imagine a future beyond, you know, so it's great. But, but yeah, anyway, so you want to talk about our, yes, of course, of course, record this, it's, yeah, it's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, once this COVID thing hit, as you said, all, all musicians, all artists, performing artists especially, were thinking, what is our role in this society? If, you know, if, mu if, if concert music stops and the world isn't any different. And first of all, I think the world is pretty different without concert music. And once it comes back, it's going to be sensational and everything. But it does get you to think about this. And very early on, I, I realized that this thing was not going to go away anytime soon. And I had a few projects with orchestra and you know live orchestra and all that and, it's, and those were suddenly out the window so it kind of forced me to invest time in, in different things and uh, now that you're talking about your initiative to do the 100 days of practice and you know kind of building your Instagram uh, presence um, I recognized that this was an opportunity you know it was a horrible tragedy for the performing arts but it was an opportunity for mus young musicians especially to adapt and kind of like um, you know uh, look the other way and and try to try to do to um, come out of this stronger. So once I, I realized live music was out, I started to plan. Uh, I started to to plot uh, my my plan to record this piece with a full orchestra. And I had no idea how to do it at the beginning, but then I realized that since I'm a Juilliard and I have access to a studio here for free because I take some class in music production. I could probably record every single instrument separately of the orchestra and then just put them all together. Um, you know, since th there's a lot of virtual, virtual orchestra things happening um, anyway, so why not do that? And uh, one thing that I was seeing a lot of people doing was asking the musicians to record themselves in their bedroom or something and sending the video. And I, th and, and, and I thought, that's cool now, but I think that's not enough. Because and uh, since I have access to the recording studio here, I'm going to record everyone myself so the, so the audio quality can be as high as possible. And, you know, for the past two months, I've been recording over like hundreds of tracks of all the whole the full orchestra playing the music. And in the end, Slatterman is going to record to it. And, you know, that's, that's what I've been doing. Like every single violin, every single flute has been, re been recorded uh, individually in a, in a, in a private um, recording session. And then I'm going to put everything together. And in addition to this, um, producing a whole music video that to go along with it, because the essence of this whole project is the dancing and the, the visuals. And if you guys see the trailer that we have out on YouTube right now, you'll see some cholo dancing. Cholo are, you know, what these people from the subculture are called. And you're going to see them like dancing the hilltop. And then you see Slatermer like playing and then a ballerina dancer playing during the more classical sounding things. And all of this, uh, I do it just so to connect with audiences, to, to propel land music in, within the classical community further and actually, you know, bring some, bring some awareness to this type of culture that most people don't know about. Um, and I'm very proud to, to think that a lot of people are going to know about my culture through this project. And I, we have people like Slatomer who has his own audience and uh, my other musicians who have their own audience. And when we all come together, we're going to be reaching a lot more people. And that's, I think that's something that's priceless. And it's all actually thanks to COVID. I couldn't have done this without COVID. So there's always a silver lining, I think. What are the next steps, just in a few words, of this project? Where, like, when is, does it have a timeline? Yes, a yes. Or is it like... Yes, as, as of now, I'm almost done recording the orchestra. I'm missing like two or three instruments. So that's very much done. And the mixing, the mastering, I already have someone who is going to help me with it. And the Juilliard School has give, given me a grant for it to, to you know, process the, the audio. 
And in late March, if, if things go as planned, so that I'm really gonna come to New York or I'm gonna go to Boston, we're still figuring that out. And we're gonna record cello part. I'm gonna put everything together. And once the audio is done, um, I'm gonna be producing the video and I'm gonna be recording musicians at school, at, in the streets, in the subway, dancers here and there. And you know, for, but first I need to have like the finished audio. And we are contemplating that this could come out somewhere in, sometime in August or July. If you're if you're lucky, if if if, uh, if COVID allows it, but uh, like th things are, have been going well, and I've been recording a lot of pe dancers back in Mexico City, um, in the, in the past months. So we already have a lot to work with. But uh, yeah, that's kind of like the timeline. Of course, thank you. And Slatomir, it is my knowledge that, believe it or not, why we're speaking right now, you're also playing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So if you're watching this uh, on on Sunday, which I assume many of you are, uh, then today you can still catch my uh, uh, live stream concert at the website dreamstage.live. And uh, it's a recital that uh, that will be available to stream until until tomorrow afternoon. If you're watching this, just don't uh, don't watch it anymore. Just go and watch Slatomir play. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Exactly. Please do. So uh thank you uh both again for first of all for your music for your wonderful artistry thank you for your support of latin american uh urban popular culture thank you for your investment in in new music and in uh, thank you slatomir for believing in younger people like horacio who are people uh, that you know, the, the, I'm sure that he's Apple. You're buying Apple stocks. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm buying too. I have to tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also <laughs> investing in Slatomir <laughs> here. Pretty young too. Yeah, it's not. I I <laughs> make some money there when he's it's like uh, it's Apple. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and uh, uh, thank you, Slatomir, for your wonderful uh, artistry and and thank you. Thank your yeah. beautiful <laughs> sound and your beautiful playing. Yeah, and Tocadre, if I may say something, thank you for contacting us and also for the uh, Sphinx catalog for Latin American for Latin American music. That's actually how I got to know you. Thank you very much. And to all of you that are uh, watching this, have a great Sunday and watch Slatomir. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> great, guys. Amazing.